Welcome to season three of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human-centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. Celebrity culture goes as far back as ancient Greece, where live theater was all the rave. During times of struggle, entertainment is an escape that allows us to disappear from the realities of life, if only just for a short while. Samita Nandi is a filmmaker, author, actor, and broadcast journalist with a doctorate degree in celebrity culture from the Department of Media at Curtin University in Australia. She is a director of the Center for Media and Celebrity Studies and a cultural critic on fame. The Center is an international organization and research network on celebrity culture. It also bridges the gaps in higher education and media by coordinating research, publications, creative productions, and media to restore artistic and ethical acts for social change. Nandi has appeared in numerous international media, including CBC National, Global National, Telegraph, Vice, Flair, Chatelaine, and more. Please welcome Dr. Samita Nandi. So, Thank you for having me. Oh, you're so glad to have you here. Before we jump in, <clears throat> we have to give a celebratory shout out to SAG after for ending right. Yes, <laughs> what a what a timely coincidence. Yeah. So, how did these last few months during the strike affect the work that you do? That's a really good question. I'm not part of the union, but at the same time, I I empathize with a lot of the concerns that actors are going through. And as a feminist filmmaker, I started to reflect on a lot of the processes that, you know, historically filmmaking has been going through, the patriarchal structure and the capitalism that it has created and the division of labor. That's one of the concerns that the union is addressing the pay and the inhuman conditions. And personally, I have gone through training, actors training, both in Hollywood and Bollywood. And I know the training prepares us for very hard conditions. And physically, emotionally, we're prepared to do that. But as a, as a scholar and as a, as a feminist artist in general, I do question a lot of the practices that have been in place. And I feel, yes, in terms of pay, in terms of uh, hours, it's not fair. And I feel very privileged to be able to produce and co-produce content that not necessarily uh, conforms to a lot of the traditional structures. Um, but just going back to your question, I did have a lot of concerns. And over time, just through my observation and my own research, I have come to really support non-traditional modes of filming and just artistic practice in general. Mm -hmm. So I feel more reassured than ever that there is progress in place. Yes. I'm not a member either, but I also felt that I had to stop some things because you're in solidarity because you don't know whether you're going to be a member in the future. So you don't want to do anything to jeopardize that. But also, yeah. also, I mean, everybody is a human and you're right a lot has changed we talked a little bit about this before we hit live on this broadcast the world has changed and the internet has changed a lot of things and certainly streaming so given the fact there have been shows that have been resurrected and 
almost as popular today as they were when they first were released on television years ago. But those actors are not getting paid <laughs> or the writers or any of the creators are not getting paid the royalties when you compare the money that's coming in to produce, like to stream that content. It's a good day in entertainment for this contract. And whether you, you're a union member or not, and this goes across every industry, whatever the union comes up with on a contract benefits the entire industry. Ultimately, I feel that filmmakers and actors and any creative professional in, in the film industry have to make choices for their own. And we have to know who we are, what values we stand up for and uh, keep creating. So that's something that, of course, you know, a lot of the training would equip us with the skills and the insight. Another thing that uh, is not related to entertainment but in a way, it kind of falls in that same category. Just a few hours ago, there was a press release from the federal government that has created legislation to ban scab workers <laughs> for during a union strike. So a federal union strike. So that's huge, really. It kind of plays in the same way. You know, that's how... All of us who were not SAG members, we refused to work on struck or promote struck work or do anything that would go against what the uh, union was going for, even if we weren't members, because you're still in the same circles. You're still playing in the same playground. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so much of the consumption is based on traditional models that the union is questioning. So I think it's very important to be informed and, and act accordingly. Yes. So let's go back in time a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about your background. And where did you grow up? So I was born in Toronto, Canada, and I, I was partly brought up there, but I was also raised in India. And I was in India from age seven and a half to 20 and a half, to be precise. So, so I was there for 13 years, and then I came back to Toronto, and I continued with my university education, and I did my bachelor's, master's, and post-grad diploma in broadcast journalism in Toronto, and before I could look for a job in broadcasting. I got hired by the University of Toronto to teach their communication program. And I also taught at Ryerson University, which is now called the Toronto Metropolitan University. Oh, yeah. And Ryerson is a well-known university for media and communication studies. Yes, yes, yes. So, so... Yeah, that's a very short version of where and how I grew up. That was really fast <laughs> world. And I didn't stop growing up while I was teaching. I wanted to go back to school and I went to Australia and continued teaching there. But I also got uh, two scholarships back to back and I did my PhD there. So yeah, um, it's interesting how... Everything happened, and um, and I guess I don't stop learning. <laughs> and yeah, I feel we can't like, stop learning. <laughs> no, no. So I'm always growing wherever I am. That's something that the PhD also taught us at the end that there's so much to learn. So I'm glad that I'm carrying that vision. I have to ask you though. I mean. I hear it's quite beautiful, but why Australia? <laughs> why Australia? <Yeah. laughs> um, well, I met my ex-partner in Perth, Australia. When I went there, I immediately started to teach at Curtin University, where I ended up doing my PhD. But yeah, I, I went there for one of the biggest reasons that human beings survive <laughs> on this planet. That was 
love. And I was very fortunate. I fell in love twice in Australia, which says a lot about the, <laughs> about the relationships. After I let go of that first relationship, then I met my current partner now, and it has been 15 years. Wow. And and you see him as my co-star right here. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm pretty open about this. Both my relations happened online. It was through online oh, dating wow. uh, because I just didn't have time. I was very yeah. busy all the time. And my dating profile was also very professional. I'm very transparent. My public life and my private life, they overlap in so many different ways. And I do a lot of interviews and panel talks. I like being transparent and having a lot of accountability. So yeah, I'm quite a lot in the public. I I understand that completely because even when you're in certain circles, well, you might see other people in the same circles dating each other there, but you wonder if it's ethical. <laughs> All you have to do is one thing to like knock it down back to the 1950s right you're up here and then you do one one thing it could be date the wrong person in that industry and it sets you back almost back to the beginning plus if you're interviewing the people it it creates an interesting dynamic which i think is another show <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 it's interesting it also depends on the personality i have met a lot of students and scholars and just women in general who feel very concerned about having their profiles online, any profile online. I think it's really about being self-assured and confident and also always having a safe space. I know cyberbullying happens. I know a lot of... <laughs> um, a lot of unethical practices do happen on the internet, but I feel that... It's very important for women to have the skills and the knowledge to have a safe space and to equip themselves to be out there. Were you an actor first or a filmmaker, media critic? <laughs> which, role, <laughs> which role I, have you played first? <laughs> I, I reverse engineered my whole... No, I was, I was an academic at the beginning and then I became an actor. Mm. And I'm very uh, fortunate to be interviewed over, you know, a number of uh, media outlets. And usually actors become successful and then they get interviewed in the media. But I have been interviewed for my academic work in advance. And, and when I do acting now, I am able to come with informed opinions. So I still continue to do interviews, but I'm able to address a lot of the questions with informed opinions and not just theoretical knowledge, which is also important. But I feel I have both the theory and the practice to address issues in the entertainment industry. Do you like acting the most which one do you love or do you like the behind scenes work better or the media critic better <laughs> which role yeah, is, it's, which it's one do i like, like better. One better right <laughs> that's a really good question i'm passionate about research and i'm also passionate about performance and that includes dance as well I think what's in common is the fact that I do a lot of public speaking. So it's not just in the media, but also whether I am doing a panel talk, whether I was teaching in the past, whether I do any public speaking, I think that's what's in common. And I'm able to share my, my experience and my practice and my knowledge uh, through that medium of public speaking that in that includes the media interviews too so yeah. I think that's what I I feel very passionate about and there's an educational component there too I like being in touch with the audiences the viewers and having an interaction with them also and having 
education and knowledge accessible. I think that at the end of the day, that's what makes me get up in the morning. Right <laughs> it's on. all about access and inclusion uh, in whatever shape and form. So yeah, that's what I would say, uh, public speaking in media and public relations. Now, entertainment to the outside world seems so glamorous and there are certainly glamorous moments. But yeah. Few outside the industry ever sees what goes into getting to that point. So yes. that is a perception you talk about, isn't it? Yes, I do talk about that too. I used to get this in sports because I've covered the National Hockey League for so many years. And I used to get people say, I still get people hearing them say, oh, I totally hate this person. You know, and it might be their persona on the ice. They may not be like that off the ice, right? <laughs> but they'll say they totally hate this person. And they'll do that with actors and creators as well, because they seem to equate the persona of the role they're playing with the human being behind it. How do you kind of balance that? Well, I, I feel that this is not too far from our close family and friends who are part of that larger audience. For me, it doesn't matter. I have a lot of relatives hating me already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I feel you. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> so personally, it doesn't matter to me because... I am very privileged and honored to do what I am passionate about. I do research, I do performances, I speak about them in the media. And, and when I talk about access and inclusion, a lot of it is about diverse women. Yeah. And that's very important. But also part of the feminist agenda is to create gender equality. So that what keeps me very grounded. It doesn't matter who says what, but it is true that the larger audience, they do kind of look up to stars and they consume them for instant gratification. They get a lot of pleasure out of it. And, and the moment that expectation is not met, then there's a lot of hatred too, or just being critical. Um, so I feel this is how the industry has been historically, it has been set up. Yeah. Just to <clears throat> create these very impossible images. We see that with women, women battle with their own self image because they're trying to keep up with this glamorous image that you know the entertainment industry has been presenting for such a long time. Wow. These are impossible, unachievable images, but I think what most people don't know is the hard work that goes behind yeah. the scenes and whether it's a star or any working actor, a star is also a working actor. Today, we're not just talking about actors, we're talking about any public persona, like you talked about hockey stars, right? People just don't have the skills to understand what goes behind the success of their work. So when I do a lot of the panel talks at my film festival, you know, I talk about the creative process and also how diverse the creative material can be. I'm really huge on advocating for that. You know, it's not some mass, overnight mass produced. <laughs> yeah material and even if it is how hard it is to do that that reminds me of the I don't know if you've seen it on Netflix the Hollywood series and it's kind of a refreshing take on old Hollywood <clears throat> back in the day and but the role with reversal of roles like instead of Marilyn Monroe the the actress was black Okay. And, no, I haven't watched that series, but this is really interesting. And it um, has a lot of the same elements, like the casting couch and all that bullcrap that you've already talked about that comes with this profession. Well, 
every profession. <laughs> but the fresh take with the diversity aspect and just how it was approached is so refreshing. So it was just like taking the similar story. And when you're watching it, you can figure out. Sometimes they had the actual name of the actor. Like they had Rock Hudson. I think his name was Rock Hudson in the series. But then there was other actors. You can kind of figure out who they might be sort of portraying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this person. is fantastic because no. with the kind of uh, technologies we have and, and development and storytelling, we can rewrite a lot of the narratives and bring social change. So this is really promising to hear. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're seeing a little bit of that besides the end of the strike and what that strike was about. Also, the fact that it is changing and we are bringing more diversity, not enough. But, okay, let's just talk about the Barbie effect for a moment, because a lot of men are wondering why it was such a big deal, but it's women. I mean, we make up such a huge percentage of the world, <laughs> and our voices are now being heard. That's why it's being embraced, right? I feel there has been a need and demand for a very long time. And of course, there has been a lot of uh, battles that have been won. If you look at women's rights and like all the challenges that women had to overcome, starting with voting, working outside home, it hasn't been perfect. I feel uh, feminism has gone to certain extremes that have actually perpetuated some biases against men, which is not cool because <laughs> the goal is to have gender equality. But overall, I think this is true of any cultural uh, movement. And there's always back and forth. You have a certain social movement, then there's like counter movement. So it's never like uh, perfect. But overall, there is progress. So that's what I would like to look at. Yeah. And it's not about just one possibility. It's very hard to achieve an ideal possibility overnight. But I like seeing possibilities. And so that's more of a layered approach. So overall, yes, there has been a need. There has been a demand. I think a lot of the women's issues that we have been seeing, they have been addressed in different shapes and forms over time. So that's really promising. And, you know, it's like sowing a seed and it's not always about having like a mass revolution and solving everything overnight. I believe in what Gandhi said, to be a living example of change. So you never know who you touch, who you inspire. And I also believe in creating spaces, you know, like uh, progressive spaces, activist spaces. Uh, one of my colleagues call activist or something <laughs> um I'm like okay so so yeah that's very important uh to enable those spaces and to enable voices it's very tough to battle and rise against challenges yeah and I think getting back to that Hollywood series it does take all those struggles and puts it in that one frame You've got LGBTQ, you've got diversity, you've got women, you've got, you know, the patriarchy, you've got all of the aspects combined. It has evolved a bit. It isn't perfect, but we are very fortunate to be living in a time where we have seen where we have seen some progress. Yes, and, yes, of course. Yeah. Yes. And the thing is, I hope. I know it's hard if you were born in a time after us where the progress was already made. So you might take it for granted that it was. Yeah. Good. But what we're seeing also is it can easily be taken away like that. It's not that long ago where we there were some things we couldn't do. So anyway. And still there are a lot of battles. And sometimes, you know, a person has to be lucky 
to have the insight, the vision, the access, the privilege. And a lot of people do have access and privilege, but they act out of fear and they don't necessarily make the moves that are required. And I feel they go back to certain traditions that are not progressive or they're not necessarily making any social change. So yeah, I think we still have a long way to go, but we are in a very good time, like you said, and we do have a lot of access to technology. And it's not about like living a Hollywood dream. It's about creating the kind of content to express yourself in the way you want using any medium you want. That's what I would say. I would just boil down to just arts and craft and just express the way anybody wants And that is also the beauty of living today because there is so much more. We don't have to pack up all of our belongings in a suitcase and trek across the country and go to Los Angeles and pray and hope we get accepted on a casting call. We can just create it and find a way to have it distributed, rent out a theater and do a screening or whatever. There's so much more options today yeah exactly and when Plus, we it isn't that. just america there's it's a global market yeah yeah exactly we are in very good times i have done a number of short films independent short films right here in lisbon portugal in general it's a very cinematic city so great for cinematography and i'm so humbled to meet so many filmmakers and actors right here who don't pursue filmmaking for fame or money. It's important to have financial resources, um, but whichever way it is, they don't do it for fame or money. It's just for pure art. And that's very, very reassuring because I have been in places like Toronto, New York, LA, and also in India, Mumbai, where the pressures from the entertainment industry are really hard and people just don't have different ways to see things. So I'm really glad that the education that I had in Australia and the the practice that I had in Europe were very... We're in very non-Hollywood, non-Bollywood spaces. So, yeah. So yes, and I've seen a lot of progress with that. I love independent arts. They are like communication tools, building community and bringing progress. And that's just such a beautiful thing. That's where the storytelling comes from. It's not just the storytelling for clicks or sensationalism or repurposing the same movie over and over again you're telling actual people's stories one act at a time (laughs) yes yes i i believe that not all social narratives tell our stories so it's very important for us to tell the story in the way we want in very authentic ways if it's just a matter of like creating a space to communicate to bring a social change you know I mean, the impact is just so valuable, but it's important to surround yourself with very aligned people Mm -hmm. uh, to do that. Uh, I also saw that the independent filmmaking business, it has a lot of politics too. And so it's not just about the corporate industries. It's also happening at the independent filmmaking level. There are a lot of politics. So it's very important to have very aligned people around you. You discuss popular culture and celebrity culture. How much does that representation play into that aspect of it where that's why you can't get some of those projects in the studio? And maybe some of those projects might not see a lot of eyeballs when they're produced, but they are such that a couple of years down the road, they're on those lists where, you know, you got to see this film. How much does that popular culture media aspect play into kind of like 
not getting some of those stories told? Um, I think the stories are, are being told. It's about outreach. You know, how far are they reaching out? And that depends on the goals of the, the filmmaker, the actors, and sometimes they just organically, they do reach out. Like uh, the film that I did here, The Leak, it's an independent short and it reached 15,000 people without any promotion. I still haven't had the time to That's awesome. work on the promotion. It's like, it just happened. People have watched the film for whatever reasons they have watched, whatever conditions they were in. Maybe they just found part of it entertaining. Maybe the whole thing entertaining. Maybe they were curious. I don't know. But I'm just glad that it went that far. Like I would never pack a small art house theater with 15,000 viewers. So you never know. But if you do put in the time and the effort to reach out, you can reach out with yeah. independent films. And of course, the ones that are industrially produced, they have stronger platforms and they have a bigger market. I think there's just like a ready market to consume. But the kind of stories independent filmmakers and actors tell, they're not necessarily market driven. So yeah. even if there's a lot of effort put in, they may not reach out. But still, the story needs to be told and you never know who it touches. Yeah, you only need to touch the right people to make it a success. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, and just to just to do it, you yeah. know. Well, yeah, to do it. To, I mean, that's another thing too is the work <laughs> that goes on behind creating a film, whether it's a short or a feature film. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's massive nobody like, has any idea outside the industry what goes into creating a film it doesn't happen overnight I don't know how many people you've got working on a short but when you look at the credits the end credits even on a Marvel movie in particular I mean yes it's big budget but look at the end credits they go on for for 10 or so minutes and most of those are the animators <laughs> yes they're yeah. not even the people that are working the grips and all the people that are working behind the scenes. They don't have enough room to put all the people's names on there. <laughs> it's crazy how yeah. people work on a film. Yeah, I know. Uh, so whether it's a feature film or a short film, a lot of hard work goes into it. But I think people who are consuming celebrity culture, they are not able to distinguish I hope they do distinguish, but often they're not able to distinguish that celebrity culture has to do with media, tabloid journalism in particular, that's different from the pure art form. So I think that's that's very important to understand. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you get the phenomena. I mean, let's face it. We all thought Beyonce was a reigning queen, but Taylor Swift is the textbook case for fame and identity. I don't think there's a more textbook case. She, you can't even categorize what it is that she's going through right now. It's such a phenomena that her fans are so loyal that they buy whatever she produces, they buy every platform of it. Like if it's a CD, if it's a stream, if it's whatever it is, they will buy it, rebuy it, rebuy it. It's crazy. The phenomena that she has. I don't think anybody else comes close to that or will ever come close to that. But uh, well, it might seem unlikely that she will fall from grace, but we do see, and this is where the media comes in too, I guess, that there are some celebrities, they'll say stupid comment online, and some others might be involved with questionable or even criminal conduct. The internet kind of grabs onto that and runs with it, but also it holds an impossible standard for some. Everybody says something stupid. God knows I've said a few things. 
we can't live up to the standard, particularly the celebrities that are being held at this standard. How do you um, even wrap your head around that? Or is there a way to kind of fix that? <laughs> it's a corporate issue. My understanding of a celebrity is that it's a media representation. It's not necessarily just the artist. Taylor Swift as an artist is different from the media representation of Taylor Swift than any pop star of her of her kind. And fame in general, it's a complex interplay of the government, the media, the businesses, the fans, and the celebrity itself. So the kind of impossible market that it has created, it's because of the, the interplay of those factors. It's not the artist anymore. How the artist survives him or herself, that's a whole different story. What kind of impacts that person has, like physically, psychologically, and and that's quite different from what we see in the media representation. It's, it's production, it's distribution, it's reception. And that changes from place to place too, because fame is very much dependent on context. So yeah, it depends on the kind of public that's consuming that and wants to like be a part of it. But that's very different from the artist yeah. herself or himself, right? And, and there's a whole management behind that. Um, that's what I would say. Yeah, it's a very it's impossible complex standard. and layered yeah. phenomena. Yeah. yeah. And speaking of impossible standards, that's where independent, independent film, all the stuff we've discussed before now, it's like, Everybody wants to hold every single movie on the planet up to a Marvel production. <laughs> uh, not, not the CGI part, but just the overwhelming blockbuster aspect of it, where it fills theaters and it reaps $200 million overnight. That's an impossible standard as well. It's, it's part of a mass culture and most people like to see more and more and more. It's, it's really about like they associate growth with productivity. But those who are in the corporate world, even doing this nine to five jobs, they are doing it because it may or may not fit their own life paths. They work in spaces and they work for hours that may not correspond to their personal needs. A lot of people get depressed and then they go back to consuming mass produced content. And we don't know what the artist is going through either. Yeah. So I think it's really a personal choice. It should be an informed choice, both for the artist and the consumer to figure out, okay, like what he or she is about. And that's where I find a lot of value with the feminist filmmaking that's just a lens of inquiry to see diverse content and enable an artist and a viewer to understand okay like what's my space we have never been trained at school or college and we're talking mass culture in general and what kind of public culture we have been a part of we haven't been trained to understand our space what pace we like and I go with a lot of vibes like it's like I I would be in places maybe it serves me for a couple of years maybe the journey is over after that maybe something higher is waiting for me and it doesn't mean bigger it just like on my own path I feel like okay my purpose is to move forward I want to learn more I want to add more value to what I'm doing so I might operate in different places according to my own times 
but this is not what the industry trains us for mm. you know it's like it's often it's often training us to work over our dead bodies and the people who are consuming they're also working over their dead bodies in corporations so it's mm. like this vicious circle going on when in the production and of the consumption of things that's where education becomes so important yeah to equip ourselves yeah. with knowledge and skills of okay what's possible what our values are and they don't teach crisis management either i'm sure <laughs> no no <laughs> if if i mean i think now people are becoming very uh, tech savvy and you know they're doing their own research so i, I think there has been progress like you have said earlier there has been a lot of progress uh particularly for women there has been a lot of progress um but at the end of the day it's also our responsibility to equip ourselves with the skills and spaces that we need so what are things that give you hope in this industry i i feel we're in a very good time with democratic technologies to tell our stories to connect with like-minded people i think this was not possible like 30 40 years ago you know like you know we were in very settled places now we have the capacity to unsettle a lot of traditions and really tune into ourselves and connect with the stories that we want to whether we want to produce or consume so i do have hope and I always look at uh, what's ethical for human rights, for animal rights, for environmental sustainability. I've seen a lot of fans shifting their ethical responsibilities to celebrity act, you know, for example. But the work of celebrity activists would fail if the larger audience don't do their part. So I feel with the technology and the space, we can bring a lot of change. Yeah. What projects are you working on? What do you have coming up? I have a premiere of a short film that I did with my cast and crew here. I'm just one of the writers and I'm one of the actors. So that's coming up November 10th. Then. So very excited about that. I'm that's also on YouTube, in, right? It's both in person and it's going to be on YouTube. We're going to live broadcast that from the venue. So that's very exciting. And I'm also in the post-production phase of one of my short films. It's a feminist dance films. I'm also in the process of drafting a novel and the film, they are quite aligned. I also run a film festival where I give an ethical voice to filmmakers and actors beyond the tabloid politics of fame. It's called uh, the Wall of Fame Film Festival. And um, very proud of the community there. I'm so proud of the filmmakers who are telling outstanding stories. So I carry a lot of responsibility to make sure, okay, the, the platforms are available and the filmmakers are receiving necessary time and space to screen and talk about their films. Wow. Thank you so much, Samita, for coming on my show. <laughs> It was a pleasure. Thank you for you know, sharing all your observations and also your hope for the future. And it would be such a joy to see more and more creatives out there telling their stories and supporting each other. I think that's yeah. ultimately what we need. Very excited about that. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. Please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.